the beginning of the year to make you busy. Um, so, so the, I'm going to give two lectures, and the first one will be about introduction to local language correspondence, abbreviated as LLC. So um, let me start with introduction and motivation. Okay, so in whatever I say, um, I fix embedding of algebraic closure of Q into algebraic closure of QP, and I write A for the ring of Adels, so, well, it's a just a, some subring of the product of all completions of Q, uh, which you may be familiar with. Um, so let me give you some rough picture of the Langlands correspondence. So yeah, what is, what is it about? Well, on one hand, we have automorphic representations, representations of, say, GLN of A. And on the other hand, you have some arithmetic objects, which are representations of the Gala group. So n-dimensional, so n is an integer, um, n-dimensional elliptic representations of the global Gala group, Gala of Q bar over Q. So you fix a prime L in this story. And this is the conjectural global long lens correspondence, which is far from proven. Um, and the local long lens correspondence is the local analog of this. So I'll just give, write down the objects we are going to look at and in, explain what they are. So here you have irreducible smooth representations of GLN. QP, and here, you, the local analog here is probably more transparent. You just look at the representations of the local Galois group. So, and well, actually you want to choose L different from P, but let me not get in there. Eventually, we are going to, well, replace this with something better, which are called Vaudelin representations. So that is going to be the local Langlands correspondence we are going to study. And you have an arrow from upstairs to downstairs. Basically, there's a way to localize at the prime p. And probably I have to explain what this means, but on the right-hand side, it's clearer. You just restrict this representation from global Galois group to local Galois group, because this is, you can find an embedding of this guy in here once you fix this embedding of Q bar into QP bar. So this is, uh, has a very clear meaning, and conjecturally, you should have a commutative diagram, and that's, often called local global compatibility. But the focus of my lecture will be eventually this guy, but to motivate this local Langlands correspondence, I have to say something about the global correspondence. Okay. But first of all, let me remark that it, this is, as I said, it's just a huge conjecture far from proven. But, well, fortunately, we know much more about the local Langlands correspondence. It's a theorem by Harris, Taylor, and Enyar. Okay. 
this around 1999. Um, but for GLC, it's, we know something, but uh, it's partially established. There are some cases where we know this. For instance, when n equals 2, we know quite a lot about this correspondence. But in general, it's wide open. And of course, um, you can, all these stories over Q, but you can work over an arbitrary number field over a finite extension of Q. And you can replace Q by a finite extension of Q. And there is a similar story. And another remark is that when n equals 1, this is just the class field theory. Well, global and local class field theory. Well, maybe I'll just write class field theory. So it's already known. And well, the historically, what happens is well, people had class field theory in the early 20th century, and then try to generalize class field theory to something. Because class field theory is about a study of abelian extensions of number fields. And you want to study eventually non-abelian extensions, Galois extensions of number fields. And well, this is well uh, the most fruitful generalization of class field theory formulated, well, in the late 20th century. OK, so what I'd like to do from now is to specialize to the case n equals 2 and give some further motivation. In the language you may be more familiar with. So, on the left-hand side, you have, well, for convenience, I'll put hospital automorphic representation. So n equals 2. Uh, OK. And conjecturally, well, this word hospital should correspond to irreducible irreducible continuous representations of, well, irreducible yeah, representations of this type. Elliptic representations mean that you're mapping into well, general linear group of some QL ball vector space. So that's the conjectural global long lens correspondence in this case. And well, there is some well subset where this can be made more explicit. Namely, you can look at cos forms in the classical sense of way two. I mean, mo modular cos forms of way two with coefficients in Q. Coefficients mean that, for instance, you look at the Q expansion of modular form, where you can look at Hacke eigenvalues. And I'm saying that the Hacke eigenvalues are in Q. So you can consider such modular forms, which is, an, to be precise, there should be eigenforms, et cetera, and et cetera. And the corresponding objects are actually elliptic curves. Well, maybe more, if I, I'll say, take modules of elliptic curves. Elliptic curves over Q. And, and you may heard of this correspondence that's the Shimura-Taniyama conjecture, which is now a theorem. So, uh, Yes. 
to this. Oh, this doesn't erase very well. Um, uh, so that's Shimura Taniyama. Conjecture, which is a, a theorem, well, due to Taylor and Wells and well, Brian Conrad Diamond, so it also proved it around 1999. Um, so, well, how does this work? Um, well, well, what is a Tate module? Well, if E is an elliptic curve, then I'll consider actually a rational Tate module, elliptic Tate module, which is just the, well, you take this L to the M torsion points of the elliptic curve and just tensor with Q. And that's going to be two-dimensional QL vector space. And, sorry? Uh, tensor, well, ZL, QL, or ZL, I mean, it doesn't matter, oh. but, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so, so, because the elliptic curve is defined over Q, with the Galois group acts on here, so, so this way, you produce a Galois representation, two-dimensional Galois representation, and, so that's, a sub-object of this guy, and it turns out to be irreducible. Um, so that's the construction here, and well, let me explain a little more about this correspondence, especially, I mean, this is a global correspondence, but um, what we want to know is what the local long lens correspondence sa say in this particular case. and. We can make it more explicit. So, so the first case we can consider is the so-called unrainified case. Uh, by which I mean, on the left-hand side, I mean that P doesn't, well, unrainified, maybe at P. On the left-hand side, I mean that P doesn't divide the level of F. And on the right-hand side, I mean that the elliptic curve E has good reduction modulo P. And it's known that it's if and only if condition. Um, and well, and in, in terms of this Galois representation, it's equivalent to saying that the inertia group at P acts trivially on the Tate module. It's a non-trivial theorem. But not too difficult. So what's the local Langlands correspondence. Well, the, well, in this case, actually boils down to a very simple statement. And namely, it's just the equality of two invariants coming from F and E. So, Right on equality, and this is what LLC is about in this case, where this guy is the, the TP eigenvalue of F. So I, I said, I didn't write, but I said that F should be an eigenform, even a new form, and you can take the eigenvalue. On the right hand side, you take something like 1 over P minus the number of points of E in FP, or in terms of the Galois representation, it's trace of Frobenius 
on the electric tape module. And the, it's just this equality is quite explicit. And, but the natural question is what happens when that doesn't happen? It, Wonder form tend to be more difficult to study when p divides the level, and elliptic curves are more difficult to study when it has bad reduction at p. So what can we say? And that's one way to motivate the local Langhans correspondence. So when you find case, <coughs> so P device level and E has bad reduction at P. And the question is whether we have analog of such an identity. Well, So that's the question. Or, well, <laughs> closely related question is, well, eventually you want to study local behavior of E at P. Well, in terms of Galois representation, what that means is you want to study this Galois representation localized at P in the sense that you only look at the the action of the local Galois group on this guy. And well, can, can this localization be described? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, the condition of the blackboard is not so good. Um, mm, <laughs> described only in terms of some purely local information about F rather than F itself. So, I mean, that's a little vague, I know, but, but really, to describe this, I mean, F is some, it gives somehow too much information. You want to really single out some local information about F, which just determines this guy. Um, so, well, yeah, what? In this story, I mean, this AP of F is in some sense purely local invariant attached to F at P. Um, and whatever local information you find, I mean, such a matching will be local Langlands correspondence. So in the sense that E and F are defined over, in some sense, number field Q. So E and F are global objects. But this guy is local object in the sense that it has an action of only the local Gala group. And you want something purely local. And well, that turns out to be really irreducible smooth representations of GL2QP, which is not obvious at all at first sight, but I mean, that turns out to be the case. So the answer, I mean, the most satisfactory answer is given by local Langmans for GL2. So um, let me just say that, well, if you have F, then you can associate representation theoretic objects to F. And there's a standard construction that's I mean, not very deep. But what happens is 
you, you're trying to match the P component of this representation pi f, which is a representation of GL to A. Um, and that is going to explain this local Galois representation. And that's going to be purely local object in the sense that pi f as a representation of GL to A can be decomposed as product of local representations. And for each place of Q, and when you take the P component of this representation, you get that which can be viewed as irreduc exactly irreducible smooth representation of GL to QP. <coughs> and on the other side, you have this local, two-dimensional local representations. Local Galois representations, and that's local Langlands correspondence. And I, let me emphasize that although this matching is about objects coming from FME, the global objects, and what's really fundamental lying under this correspondence is a purely local statement which has nothing to do with F or E. So, and once you understand this very well, then you can go back to the global situation and you can say a lot about, well, bad reduction of elliptic curves or representation theory of GL2 of A, namely the automorphic, the theory of automorphic forms. You can say a lot about both sides once you establish this correspondence. So that's basically my motivation for studying this. It's only one aspect but probably good enough for now. And what I'd like to do next is to explain some of the words I haven't defined. For instance, what are smooth representations of GL2QP? Or I'll also talk about kind of better candidates for local Galois representations. Um, OK, so let's do that. Mm. So basic definitions. So let so from now on, everything will be local. So let k be a finite extension of QP and denote by OK the ring of integers. And I'll take a uniformizer whose principle generated by that element is going to be max, unique maximal ideal of this guy. In particular, this quotient will be, in this case, a finite field. So let me say the el number of elements is Q, a power of P. And I'm going to first introduce smooth representations. And next, I'll introduce Vedelin representations. And the local Langlands correspondence will be precisely formulated as a correspondence between such objects and Vedelin representations. So, okay, so smooth representation theory of piadic groups. But for my purpose, I'll just specialize to the case of GLN. Okay? So G is GLNK. So it's equipped with piadic topology. And 
we want to study representation theory of this group G. Mm. So, well, one thing to note about this group is its topology is very funny. It's totally disconnected. And it contains a sequence of subgroups like, like this. Namely, if you consider all, rep all matrices with entries in OK and those guys which are identity matrix modulo pi, and modulo pi squared, etc., then you get a sequence. And all these turns out to be compact open. So it's quite unusual in the Archimedean world, but somehow in the Piatic world, this happens. And in particular, G turns out G is locally compact. And well, and the topology in terms of these groups is such that, well, basically these guys give you an open basis around the identity element for this topology. So, well, I mean, everything will be clearer when n equals one, where this is the usual sequence. It's okay cross and the one units and, well, things like that. So, Okay, so um, what do I want to say next? Well, let me, uh, let me remark that, well, basically, everything I'm going to say works on, um, well, I could work with any k points of any reductive groups defined over k, but I'm not going to do that here. By the way, I uh, should probably give a reference. I mean, there's a non-standard reference you, which you may look at for this purpose. Uh, if you visit Florian Herzig's website, he has written 11-page note. Uh, as an introduction to smooth representations of periodic groups. And that gives you further references, so I think that's a probably a good starting point. Although there are more standard references, but maybe more difficult to read for beginners, so if you're interested. Because I'm not going to give all precise definitions, so you can read more about this. Okay, so let K be C or QL bar, which will be the coefficient field of my representations. So, well, well, maybe I'll just consider now pi v, a representation where v is a vector space over k and pi is gives representation of G on the vector space V. And one thing to note here is that often this, this representation is infinite dimensional. So one has to be a little careful in this representation theory. But anyhow, well, For now, I haven't imposed any condition on this representation, but for the representation to be smooth, it has to satisfy some further conditions. So, um, smooth if 
Um, one way to say it is it's just a union of k fixed vectors, vector spaces for open compact subgroups. Or, in other words, um, equivalent, equivalently, um, for all G, the function mapping, or uh, not for all V, rather, pi G of V is smooth. And in this totally disconnected world, smooth means just locally constant. So hence the name smooth. OK. So in other words, every V has an open stabilizer, stabilizer, which is an open subgroup of G. So oh, K invariant subspace of V. The collection of elements which are fixed by all elements of K. Okay, so well, so uh, when probably. One has to understand what it, this means when n equals 1. But in that case, you're just looking at, well, basically irreducible representation will be one dimensional. So it's just this representation. Um, and the smooth means that it factors through some open complex subgroup of k cross, which means, well, in other words, OK cross has finite image, although K cross doesn't have to. So basically, that's what happens. Um, but as I said, typically when N is 2 or bigger, the representation will be typically infinite dimensional. OK. OK. So, um, In representation theory, and we are interested in the representation theory, smooth representations, and in particular, irreducible smooth representations, as we always do. We are interested in irreducible representations in any representation theory. But, but there, there are some fundamental problems in representation theory in whatever context you are. For instance, you want to construct all representations may be irreducible first. And you want to classify all irreducible representations. I mean, that's common in any representation theory. And the local Langlands correspondence doesn't shed much light on the first question, but it's ab more about the second question in that it classifies all irreducible smooth representation in terms of Galois representations, local Galois representations, which are more arithmetic than, well, this object. And, well, but we, well, I'm not going to talk about the first question, but I mean, there's well, rather satisfactory theory. For instance, there's the theory of types developed by Bushnell and Kutsko in constructing representations. But, well, but about the second question, let me give you a course classification. <laughs> So 
among irreducible smooth representations, GLN K representations. There are some particular representations of interest. For instance, there's a square integral representations. And there's a supercospital representations. And unfortunately, I have no time to define them. Um, you can look at Herzig's note, for instance. But let me just, but they can be defined in terms of matrix coefficients. Um, and to be precise, this makes sense when k equals c, but not a priori for QL bar. But anyway. Um, what happens is, basically, the study of irreducible smooth representations is reduced to the study of supercospital representations in this story, which are particular kinds of representations which can be viewed as building blocks for all smooth representations, or in a, in, in a sense, it's, they are most mysterious. But once you understand this, I mean, there's a standard procedure to construct square integrable representations and all irreducible smooth representations. You know, it's a it's a standard. Like it's a Bernstein's Elevinsky theory. So, so this will be the fundamental object of interest and to motivate Mieda's lecture, let me just say that um, how do we study supercospital representations? I mean, they are most mi mysterious in the sense that well, you don't have, for real Lie groups, you don't have analogs of supercospital representations. And also, it's not obvious a priori whether supercospital representations even exist. Although I haven't defined the definition. But, well, anyway. So they are very difficult to study, but the point is that um, you can access these supercospital representations using geometry, using arithmetic geometry or even rigid geometry. So, and eventually you can even prove local online correspondence using this geometric method. So that's why rigid geometry comes into the picture. And I'll explain more in the second lecture where I introduce Rapoport zinc spaces. Okay. I mean, you can study non supercospital representations as well, but the, the fundamental interest lies in understanding supercospital representations in the context of local Langlands. Okay, so my, my next mission is to introduce Veidlin representations. Ah, that's a, that's a good question. Is that I think there's some people investigating this question. I mean, for instance, if if you look at Michael Harris's ICM article, then he proposed this as a question, open question. I mean, the relationship is not completely understood. But there's a recent progress, for instance, in the work of um, Boyachenko and Weinstein, and I think more is more and more. Is, revealed in this in that direction. Yeah. Well thanks for the question. Um, so the so let me now introduce Vaidlin representations. Mm. So 
Well, first of all, I have to introduce the V group. So let's consider the exact sequence. GK is by definition the Galois group of K. So there, the residue field is FQ. So there's a there's this exact sequence of groups. So IK denotes inertia, the inertia subgroup. Um, so it's, we all know well that the last group is isomorphic to z hat, the profile and completion of z. And there's two possible normalization. I choose the one matching one with geometric Frobenius, sending, well, arithmetic Frobenius would send x to x to the q, but I take the inverse of that isomorphism, and that's going to be geometric for Venus. OK. Um, and let me call this map V, some sort of valuation on the Gala group. So the V group, oh, maybe I can keep this. Well, for some reason, we like to, we don't want to use the full Gawa group, but uh, something called V group, which is by definition the inverse image of Z. So this collection of elements of the full Gawa group which have integral powers of Frobenius. OK. And the Veidlin representation can be defined as follows. Um, it's a triple rho V n, where V is a finite dimensional k vector space. So unlike in the previous story, everything is finite dimensional. And rho gives the action of WK on V. And it's continuous with respect to discrete topology on V. So you can say that the inertia has finite image. So it doesn't care about the topology on V or the field K, where K is C or QL bar. Um, and N is a certain endomorphism of V, such that for all elements of the V group, um, you want something like uh, I think it's q to the minus v tau times n. Mm. Well, so if you're new to this Vedelian representation, you can basically just forget n. n is a Neopotent operator, but it probably just complicates the picture, so you can just forget. And it doesn't matter for my introduction. But n comes from the kind of electric log, electric log of the tame inertia action and the, of the local Galois group. So I mean, this law is like how the tame inertia element is intertwined with Frobenius. It's something like that, but. Anyway, so advice is Just forget or ignore n if you wish. Although it turns out to be important eventually. OK, so um, yeah. Uh, let me just def define two notions. Is 
It's called, well, Frobenius semi-simple. If, well, I mean, one of the equivalent ways is if rho tau is semi-simple for all tau. Although you can impose something weaker, and that turns out to be equivalent. And it's irreducible if, well, rho is irreducible and n is 0. Uh, OK. Uh, all right. Hmm, maybe I'll erase this. Hmm, getting very warm. Hmm? Oh, maybe I, sh I shouldn't. Okay. Um, all right, so let me give you some course classification of this Vaderlin representation. Well, which is sort of counterpart of the previous diagram. Um, so you consider all n-dimensional Vaderlin representations, or Frobenius semi-simple Vaderlin representations, if you like. Um, they are in decomposable representations in the sense that it's not a direct sum of any two sub-representations. I mean, this is the usual notion in representation theory. And of course, there are irreducible representations. OK. And well, it turns out that the supercluster representations correspond to irreducible representations and square integrable to indecomposable representations under the local long lens. So let me now state the local long lens correspondence in a precise form. OK, so statement. I mean, today's goal is really to understand the statement of local lens and nothing more. So, so the theorem, I'm not going to, well, list every condition that it has to satisfy, but basically there exists a unique bijection between irreducible smooth representations, GL and K representations, and this n-dimensional Frobenius semi-simple Vaderlin representations of WK. So I, I call this Vaderlin representations of WK on a k vector space where k is fixed, but you can do this for QL bar, but the classically is stated when k is c. So, OK, so uh, there is, exists a bijection such that uh, well, which one do I want to erase? Well, it, oh, let me list just some conditions. When n equals 1 is, well, basically given by composing with local RD map. So the local class field theory provides you with an isomorphism 
canonical isomorphism from k cross to abelianization of wk. And well, if you have and when n equals one, if you have a representation of k cross, then you can just m map chi to a representation of wk by composing with this isomorphism, right? Um, so, well, maybe art inverse, uh, something like that, right? So that's a w, wk to GL1C. So that's the, so when n equals one, it sh should be just given by this isomorphism. Um, and moreover, it should be compatible with various things like duals, twists, base change, and Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. <laughs> so twist means that uh, you're twisting by characters, and base change means you can pass from k to some other, some finite extension of k, where you should have also similar bijection, and it's, it tells you what happens when you pass from one base field to another, um, and there's. Also, there's an equality of local L and epsilon factors. So you can define L factors and epsilon factors independently on, on this side and on that side. And it turns out to be they are equal under this correspondence. Yes, so, I mean, yes, and sort of any, any one-dimensional representation factor through this abelianization, so I was just, yeah, ignoring that fact, but yes, I mean, you're right. Okay. So finally, so, and you can actually use fewer conditions than this to pin down this local long lens correspondence. But I'm not going to do that here. Finally, as I said before, let me note that this supercospital representations corresponds to irreducible vaguely representations and square integrable representations correspond to indecomposable representations. And well, you can say more, but there are many interesting matching properties you can prove and observe. And for this, maybe modulo the matching of supercospital representations, I think one nice introduction is maybe Kudla's article on local long lens in motives proceeding. It's published in 1994. So I think you can read more about this. And I forgot to say, but about Vedelin representations, maybe there's a Richard Taylor's article Galois representations found on his website, and you can read also more about Vedelin representations in more precise terms. So I think my time is almost up. So I'll probably stop here and probably get some questions. Are there any questions or comments? <laughs>